I can remember the phone ringing at home and my father talking to somebody quite seriously on the phone. Then he shouted to me, do you have the ring number for the Berlin mark? And I said, yes, I'd written it, because he, what we've been talking about in these archives, it's very important to keep diaries. And so I kept a diary right from the beginning and I had its ring number written down. And he said, it's Jack Mavro on the phone. And this is Jack Mavro Kadate. A Merlin has landed in his next door neighbour's garden and he caught it and he wants to know whether it's yours. And that's, well, it's the opposite way to a walk because I walked north. They'd obviously gone south. The other, pre- the other side of Salisbury Plain, so a good 30 miles from where we lived, and it happened to land in the garden next door to Jav- Maverick Adato and he caught it. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back for another episode of the Falconry Toll podcast and what is now the 14th episode in our series featuring falconers from the uk and of course i have to make mention of the two falconers that help make this series possible being simon tires and neil davies and simon of course is also the author of the book the specialist falcon if you haven't picked your copy up yet i highly recommend you do so you've heard me promote it many times before here on the podcast but it's worth mentioning again because it's a great book to have on your shelf lots of great information about flying long wings in particular and also incorporates more modern applications like flying to the drone and things like that and if you are interested you can also get a signed copy from simon on the website as well so if you haven't picked up your copy yet head to the specialistfalcon.com and definitely do so and of course neil is also the editor for Pursuit Falconry and Conservation Magazine. If you haven't subscribed to this publication, I highly recommend you do so as well. There's lots of great information packed into every issue, and there's a lot of good art and advertisement for new products in falconry and things of that nature as well. So it's definitely worth checking out. And if you haven't subscribed, I highly recommend you head to pursuitfalconry.co.uk and do so. It's well worth the money. And this episode is another special one that I'll always remember because it took me to the British Archives of Falconry, and I got a chance to record this episode with Mark Upton in the main room of the archives, and the vibe and just the overall atmosphere was very, very aesthetic and and very, very nice to be able to just sit in the midst of uh, all these different cool pieces of falconry memorabilia and just have a discussion with someone over a lot of falconry nostalgia and lots of very cool memories with a lot of people who are very well known in the sport so very special thanks again to simon and mark for taking the time to make this episode happen and i really hope that you all enjoy it So without further ado, I give you all this conversation that I had with Mark Upton at the British Archives of Falconry. Here we go. Mark, great to meet you. Great to uh, meet you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, no, thank you. And thanks for uh, meeting me here on a rainy, dreary, overcast Sunday afternoon. I hope you didn't have anything else better to do today. But No, though a bit surprised to see the rain because it wasn't forecast, but God, we need it. <laughs> Worst drought since 76. Or really? Yeah. Really? You guys yeah. had issue, much issues with that in the past then? or No, this year's just particularly bad, but just global warming, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we won't get into that debate on here, <laughs> no. but uh, but no, this uh, this place is is very cool. For everyone listening, we're recording this at the British Archives of Falconry, and we are sitting here in what is a very, very cool looking, I don't know, you, I guess you could almost call it a study, you know, or a uh, someone's home library type of vibe. There's bookshelves with lots of leather bound, fancy old looking books. There's lots of hoods. There's incredible paintings. Yeah. They, I mean, you guys have done a, a good job. With Thank this. you. Well, the, what you mentioned is exactly what we were trying to achieve here was to be like sitting in a falconer study. Um, particularly, it was based around my father. Really, a lot of people said they wanted it to be like his study at home, where you know you could pull out books and have a look through them and talk about paintings and go for old letters and diaries. And that's, I hope, what we achieved. I think it's got quite a nice feel no you guys have done a a heck of a job see i like i was telling you kind of before we got started this is kind of the um 
this is kind of the vibe that I know if I was going to see something archival or something where there's a lot of older history, especially lots of vintage type stuff, you know, this is the the kind of layout that I that I enjoy walking into. Yeah. You know, it, it keeps the, the vibe. Well, in fact, we tried to stay away from the, the museum type thing, partly because we knew we couldn't do it. We didn't have funding. Um, so this all the funding is, that we got here has come through Falconry. Um, funding is very different in the UK compared to America, where the archives have got good funding. Um, we don't have any tax breaks here for funding. So big companies don't fund in the same way as they do in the States. Um, so we knew we couldn't go the the big smart museum way. So, I mean, actually, this building belongs to my father-in-law, and he lets us have it f for the archives, a, a very reasonable rent, and it was just a nice building and space to use. Yeah, um, well, you just happened to marry into some extra benefits, then. You yes. Know, some... <laughs> well, funnily enough, funnily enough, um, this farm belong my uh, father and mother-in-law have had this farm since fifty. I think my father hawked on it in the early 60s and was great friends of theirs so it's got a real falconry history as well oh nice. all my all my father's early partridge hawking was done here unfortunately there's not enough partridge here now to to hawk but um though we do catch the odd one <laughs> yeah no I mean it's unfortunately like I've mentioned and like we've talked about so many times before on on this podcast it's you know the good areas with with tons of game you know, all the areas that had lots of different types of traditional game are just, they're vanishing year by year. I know. And one of the nice things about this building, there is the area it is. Um, we're only sort of 25 miles from Salisbury Plain, which was the home of the old hawking club and the great rook hawking days and previous hawking as well. And we're only about five miles as the crow flies from Avebury, where there was a lot of hawking in the early days of the BFC. Uh, the the BFC more or less started with hawking around Avebury, so there's enormous history just just in this area. And we're on the uh, edge of the Marlborough Downs, which is an area of outstanding natural beauty, but did have a lot of partridge in the past. And there's there's huge history of falconry in this area going back to medieval times. Really, so so it's really well placed as well. Well, very nice. Yeah. We'll we'll talk do, talk some more about that then, because you know we <laughs> in our country we don't have. The, the ability to be like, oh, well, so you know, King so-and-so or, you know, Lord so-and-so didn't, you know, you know, come and hunt like our <laughs> our field that's right next to Walmart now, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, like, if you could go into some of the, that history, that'd be really well, cool. Well, some of it, the early history is tenuous. I mean, but um, David, who's here with us today, but not doing this interview, lucky chap, but <laughs> he, he knows more about it than me. So maybe he should have been speaking, but... Um, there is there's big links to um, different falconers who lived in this area. If you go far enough back, Queen Elizabeth the first falconer hmm. lived not far from here. Really? And, um, yeah. So, um, but the, most of the history is a bit later. A, a lot of the um, the famous heron hawking and kite hawking was more on the eastern side of the country. But when when that came to an end and the BFs and um, the old hawking clubs started they were looking for open country where there was rooks in the Salisbury Plain which is now a military training area um was ideal it was a huge area of open rolling downland and um so they started there and went on for a number of years um and it's all written about in my father's first historical falconry book which is actually I'm told is the book that um sort of preempted the the starting of your archives in the states oh okay that it was called bird in the hand and it came out in 1980 okay yeah kent carney saw that and a few other falconers and thought we've got to save falconry history yeah. and archives hence the and, and kent has told me that himself he that was the reason that you you set up and then of course we felt left behind and but <laughs> i think i think it was actually slightly more we had a worry that you know, we got a lot of falconry history here and it, it was going to America. Now, I mean, we're in a lovely situation because we've been on good terms with, with Kent and, and the American archives ever since they started that we do share stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't bad feeling that it was, was going, but we did think, oh, we need something here just because English falconry history should be in England. Sure. And we'd love to share it, but it's here. No, oh, yeah. And then and another thing we've been doing a bit here is 
um, encouraging other European countries to do the same. Because the, the big thing you learn when, when you start studying Falconry history is it isn't anything to do with one country. It was so international, you know, going really, again, back into medieval times when, when presence of hawks between ruling families was a big, big thing, much as it is with the Arabs now. Um, you know, a lot of early politics in Europe was done through falconry. Yeah. Um, even to the extent where the, there's certain evidence that during the Crusades, the, the European falconers actually went hawking with the Arabs during breaks in the fighting. And, you know, falconry is international. And it's, and it's up until this day, it's international. So much of our history, particularly in the UK, is... Um, yeah, connected especially to Holland, where a lot of our hawks came from, mm -hmm. f from Falkenswad, and a lot of our equipment came from. But it, but also hawks went from here to Europe, because um, particularly Scottish peregrines were quite renowned um, as ISs. We were getting passage hawks from Falkenswad, but a lot of ISs went from the UK to other countries. So yeah, so it is international. And what we we'd really like to see is. Um, the sharing of you know archives set up in Germany and Holland and and uh, France and Spain and then us all, all working under the same sort of umbrella and and sharing stuff and again with in America sure yeah, yeah. and and I, I I do vaguely remember Kent talking some about some of that stuff now whenever I had the chance to talk to him and yeah. John and at the archives recently too well so. Kent along with my father um, when we started this um, there were both our, our honorary patrons and Kent was fa absolutely fantastic. He, when, when we said we were going to do this, he sent me a long letter with a list of instructions of how to, how to start an archive, which was brilliant actually, because, you know, we said we were going to set, an arch set up an archive, but you don't know all the ins and outs of how to set it up and who to deal with. And one of the most important things I remember he wrote in it was don't set it up to be an ar archive for the general public set it up to be an archive for Falconers. The general public can enjoy it, but you've got to have Falconers on your side. And we've done that, I hope, from the very beginning. We've we've done it for Falconry. Um, and because of that, we're supported by Falconers. And we were also really careful not to set it up as, you know, the biggest club here is the British Falconers Club and the oldest club. But we didn't want to be the British Falconers Club archive because if you do that, you immediately cut out every other Falconer who isn't a member. So this is really for all falconry and all, and all falconry related things as in conservation and, um, as I mentioned, international stuff and art and everything related to falconry. Sure. Yeah. And I, I know that's a big reason why Kent said at one point, I, I think I remember him telling me this, but it's a big reason why we're just the, the archives of Falconry now, like in, in Boise, you know, mm -hmm. in, instead of just specifying a, a particular country yes. or nationality or whatever. Yeah. I mean, cause I mean, there's, yeah. it, there wouldn't be any, I mean, it, it didn't start in America, <laughs> no. you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it all came from somewhere else. Well, in, interestingly, I, I think we had a great influence on the American falconry and I, th and I think Kent actually is kind enough to have, have written that. And I actually, I first met Kent, Kent when I was a child hawking with my father in Scotland in the late 1960s and the early seventies. He used to come over with Jeffrey Pollard, who was a great name here. And um, I think two seasons stayed for you know two or three weeks and and helped. And that's when I first met him. But back at that time, um, there was quite a number of American falconers came over to see the grouse hawking in Scotland. And um, I think they went back. They learned a bit, not everything. They learned what was bad as well as good. <laughs> And um, went back and are now showing us how to do it. But I, but I think it was, a, as, as Kent says, it, it, it did help American falconry. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I there's lots of different, yeah, I mean, like I said, everything kind of came from somewhere else. So different people have taken bits and pieces from here, there, and everywhere. And, of and yeah, and just made it their own. And yeah, and, yeah I mean, it's, it's just funny because... Well, the right. amazing thing about falconry is you, you, as you get older, you learn that you know less and less. Sure. And you, and you do learn from other. My father was the first person who really travelled a lot in the Middle East going hawking. And he came back with lots of ideas on particularly how to train peregrines because he started by going to the Gulf states 
in his first years. And, um, you know, they knew how to handle passage peregrines. And it sort of, that had gone here a bit because there'd been a break. And though we were flying ISIS quite well, mm. they they hadn't been so many passages available. And then my father, because there was no regulations in the early 60s, he was bringing them back. He was bringing good Hubara peregrines back and flying at Rooks here on the Marlboro Downs where we, where we sat. And then, but he learned a lot. He said he learned a lot about how to, how to handle passages because the Arabs knew and they they spend a lot of time with their hawks and they're fantastic hooders and things. And so, you know, even up, and, well, up until now, people are still learning from different cultures. Sure. I think it's a really important part of falconry. And also, as I mentioned, with the archives, we're sharing stuff and that's important. Yeah, no, of course. And I think now would probably be a good time to go ahead and, and transition since you've already kind of mentioned it a couple of times in, in passing. And uh, I mean, just go ahead and, and talk about some of your early history and getting into the sport. And I'm assuming that a lot of that was probably influenced by interactions with, with your dad, right? Yeah, I, I had an easy start. I, I, I feel a bit of a, a fraud in the Falkland world because most people work really hard at getting started. And I had it <laughs> given me on a plate. Um, <laughs> And I didn't even know if I wanted to do it or not. I just morphed into it. Um, I grew up, I mean, I mean, there's a picture of me in a, in a nappy trying to put a hood on a tissel on the lawn at home. <laughs> um, so they've, they've just all, Falcons have always been around. And I had a really lucky start because my father's great friend was Stephen Frank, who was another great falconer. And they hawked, when, when I was born, they were hawking a lot together and he was, made my godfather. So I also spent a lot of my life hawking with Stephen Frank as well as my father. Um, but yeah, my father, the the time I was born was big into partridge hawking. And then very quickly after then, about 1960, I was born 64. In 66, I think he had his first, he tried grouse hawking a few times, he and Steve together. Um, but they actually got the opportunity to go grouse hawking properly with the film actor James Roberts and Justice in the north of, he had an estate in the north of Scotland and had very good grouse numbers and then he had previously had Philip Glazier who's a you know lots of people know as his professional falconer but that that they split up and Stephen Frank and my father started going there as guests rather than professionals they came to an, an agreement that they could use the ground and take out James and his guests um and that lasted for a number of years um and then we started in the late, I think it was 1967 or 8, we had the first foreign falconers coming to Scotland. Well, some Americans as guests before that, but first falconers who came to actually fly with their own hawks from Europe at, at Grouse. And they were um, three Italians. And then they were joined by Christian Saar from Germany, um, Patrick Morel and Gilles Nottier from France, and it suddenly became a real international sport in Scotland during the 70s and into the, well, up, up to now. But it was great for me because I was starting, I, I had been given my first hawk, which was a Jack Merlin um, that had come from Bill Rutledge, who was a famous name in England in the early days of the BFC. Um, and I think I was nine, I was nine or ten. I was given this and I used to fly it on the fields around here. Um, I also used to take it to Scotland um, with my, my father was flying I mean, grouse, but we were allowed, my, my brother had a Merlin as well. We we're given one each and we used to go out in the mornings before they went grouse hawking proper. And it wasn't the best lark hawking because there's too much cover there, but he used to get them going. And then I used to have to come home from school. My mother would drive me south and then I'd be picked up outside school in Marlborough, which is the local town, and brought up onto the downs by my mother, who was actually quite a good falconer herself. And we'd go out lark walking. My brother lost interest immediately, so I suddenly had two <laughs> Jack Merlins. And I actually, unlike most people with Merlins, I actually flew them for a number of seasons. Their best season was the first season, but they, they flew for five seasons before they went back into a breeding project. And um, they, they flew well. Um, but all that time I was also handling, not flying, but handling my father's peregrines. And I was made to carry the cadge on the on the moor. As soon as I was tall enough that the legs of the cadge reached off the ground, I had to carry the cadge. <laughs> and I was hawking with all these different people because 
we were all on moors near each other in the north of Scotland. So, you know, two or three days a week, we'd be hawking with somebody else on their ground or they'd be on our ground. So I was influenced by all these different styles, which I think was just an incredible education, which not many people have been lucky enough to get. Um, and then I actually didn't have my first peregrine, though I could fly peregrines because I often helped my father. But I didn't have my first peregrine until I left school when my father gave one of his first that he bred to me, who turned out to be the best tissel I ever had. Absolutely outstanding. And he taught me more than I taught him, I think. But he was a real great. And he, um, in his in his first, we caught the first grouse he saw, which was complete luck. But it, <laughs> you know, you need luck, don't you? Mm-hmm. And um, he went on, and I think he killed 25 grouse in 28 flights or something in his first season before I had to come south. Um, yeah, you got lucky. <laughs> I got very lucky. I got very lucky because, you know, a hawk like that does teach you a, a lot, you, even though you can learn a, a lot yourself. But if you've got a hawk that goes up and waits in the right position at a, a great pitch, you can concentrate on a lot of other th- getting other things right. Whereas if you're having to try and get the hawk go as yeah. well, if it isn't a natural, yeah, especially I... for an, an early hawk, you know, you've got so many, especially game hawking, you've got a lot of things to think about. Um, particularly with a, a bird like grouse, which run rather than flush if they can. You, you're using a pointer. It's not like, I mean, partridge hawking where you're spotting is fantastic sport, don't get me wrong, but you, you've got a lot more control of the situation, whereas on a grouse moor, you, you, the wind is very important and all, there's all sorts of things going through your mind at the same time as you, you're thinking, oh, the wind's just changed a few degrees, so I've got to get to a different position on the point or... You know, the grouse is going to go to that gully. I've got to try and get that side to, to stop it or get the hawk, pull the hawk that way to stop it coming under it um, and different things. And it, I always think flying a particularly grouse hawk, but any game hawk, well, you your mind is not just thinking of the hawk. You're thinking of a hundred different things at the same moment. And it's all got to click together. Otherwise it goes wrong. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I, I found that... Um... So I was kind of both blessed and cursed at the same time with a really good red tail for my first bird. Mm. And it's not been until, you know, seven, eight years later here where I've thought back and realized, you know, you, it's, it's a blessing because anytime you get a great bird, Mm. it's, it's good. But unless you've had a few not so great birds or not so great experiences first, it doesn't really make you appreciate what you have in a really, really good bird. And you don't realize until you've after, after you've already turned it loose or something else has happened that you, what you really had. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I didn't, I I did know I had something fantastic at the time because everybody was telling me this, this is one and and you won't have another in your lifetime like it. I can't appreciate it. It's true. And I've had good ones since. But I don't. I question whether they would have been quite so good if I hadn't had him in the first place to learn with. And also, I've had the odd bad ones. Well, I, I don't think there's many bad peregrines, but there's some you've got to work at a lot more. Mm-hmm. And that's what, as I say, you're still learning into old age in <laughs> falconry because you think, oh, I can train a peregrine after you've had two or three. At least if they've been successful, you think, well, oh, you very easily, I think, get a bit big-headed and think I can train anything. It's an easy trap to fall into. Yeah, very easy. easy. Yeah, but very, very. What, what you realise as you get older is they're all different. Every single peregrine, exactly. is different. I mean, I I'm talking about peregrines because that's basically what I fly. But it's the same it's true of any species, species. exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And um, and changing species is very difficult. My father used to like jerks. I hate jerks. I find them <laughs> the most temperamental, especially jerkins. Yeah, a peregrine is much more straightforward. But you make a mistake with a jerkin, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the same with. I mean, a lot of my friends fly goshawks, and and I'm I'm not a big goshawk fan. I'm not a big sipiter fan in general. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, everybody's got their preferences, and some guys are like, well, if it's not if it's not gray, it's not it's not worth flying, you know, whatever <laughs> this yeah. that and the other. They, people just find what what they like, and and uh, I'm consequently too, it's what they don't like, and yeah. that's why they stick with something. A lot of guys stick with, you know, they you know, just know that line they need to keep towing because otherwise it's like, mm, it's not going to work out too well for them. Yeah. But I think that's one of the lovely things about falconry. You know, all falconers are different and you do get some falconers who love flying different species. One I can think of, you know, one of the greats I can think of 
immediately is Christian Tsar, who I spoke about earlier. He's now in his 90s. And he was hawking in until two years ago when he was 90. But unfortunately, COVID has sort of hopefully not finished it for him, but it's made it mm -hmm. difficult. But yeah, there was a one of the very top long wing flyers. You know, so much so that my father said the first time he met him in the 1970s, he went to a German meeting, that there was a queue of more than 100 people stood to watch Christian fly because he was the the person to watch. And um, But he flies a goss equally as well. He loves them just as much as he loves a peregrine. And I actually really enjoy going out. No, I'm not a goss man myself. I love going out with Christian with a goss because it is, you know, to watch somebody who has flown gosses well for 60 years or 70 years even it's, it's just magic and um but you, then you get other falconers who who really like me i've specialized in peregrines though i do like merlins yeah you, know, you get the specialists as well but you know there's no laws to falconry is there? and there's no, no rules that you should follow and sure yeah yeah. yeah, no, totally agree. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a very much teach their own type of sport. Mm. And yeah, basically, if, uh, you know, if one guy doesn't like something, well, all the power to him doesn't doesn't yeah. affect what you're doing. Yeah. You know? And it's very easy also to grow, grow up with specific ideas, because I mean, here, most there's very few. I've never seen what I call a decent saker in the UK, because we're not a country where we get them naturally anyway. And um, those who have imported them, you're not going to be able to import the top sakers from Asia and places because you're competing with the Arabs. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, I think we get the rubbish here, and and that, and they don't fly well in the wind anyway. And England's a windy country, mm -hmm. so I thought, you know, sakers are rubbish. And then I first went hawking with a Saudi friend who I still hawk with, but my father took me when I was 18 for my first proper Hubara hunting trip. And the Saudis are not peregrine men. They, it was just sakers and a, and a few jurors. And these sakers were something like you've never seen. Really? We start with you walk into the camp and you had a job telling which were sakers and which were peregrine, um, which were jurors until you looked at the length of the wing because there was no size difference or very little size difference. And, um, and these sakers, they fly like, uh, yeah, they, some of the ringing, flights of Hibara we were having and they're so persistent and they can stoop so hard and um I think it was much like the heron hulking of of the old days here hmm. yeah you, you could chase a flight for five or ten minutes with a Seiko and maybe see 30 or 40 stoops hmm. and and they're beautiful as well I mean they're not fluffy things like we get here they they're sleek and fantastic looking birds so so you shouldn't ever have prejudices either i mean a lot of people don't really approve of harris hawks here but i mean a good harris hawk flown well can be worth watching yeah yeah well yeah. and as as you know i mean red tails and harrises are a huge foundation of falconry in america i mean course, it, is, yeah. it was it's a huge huge amount of your falconry is with is with hawks like that so yeah. so yeah i mean I mean, you're welcome to have your prejudices, I guess, if you want, or your preferences. But I mean, doesn't necessarily mean that just because yeah, you've not. But they seen can it, be proved wrong. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and just because you haven't seen a good one fly doesn't mean there's not good ones flying, you no. know, somewhere. So, no. yeah. But just so just out of curiosity, I, I have to ask, and I mean, you don't necessarily have to name names or anything if you don't want. But growing up, I'm sure with all the successes that you've that you've seen, with all these pretty renowned falconers coming to to hawk with your family and and all these different things kind of happening with you growing up seeing what what were kind of some of the i don't know if you can even call them funny but some of the more noteworthy things that not just the good lessons but some of the hard lessons that you learned from watching <laughs> other people fly well i think that was actually one of the benefits of seeing all these these people fly because you saw some of the mistakes as well yeah mm -hmm. and try not to do them myself though of course we all make mistakes mm -hmm. but um yeah but some of the funny things were lovely i can i can remember being out with stephen frank on his ground and um a hawk we were flying near one of the locks well lock is a lake mm -hmm. scottish mm -hmm. term for lake and um he his fork there's an island on this lake and of course the grouse 
it, it happened in the past, but I hadn't seen it before. But the grouse go for the island. Anyway, his his hawk, um, I think it was Bragatha, who was a hell of a good eye waiting on Falpen, very small. Um, she killed on the island. <laughs> so Steve, and we had um, French falk, well, Belgian falk, falk and Patrick Morel was out with his wife and um, Giannotti and his wife. So Steve, being a bachelor, was very embarrassed about going to have to swim to this island to get the grouse back. <laughs> So he um, he went behind a sort of bank and stripped off, and then we saw him sort of dive into the edge of this lake <laughs> in just his his pants, um, oh, underclothes, <laughs> um, and and go off breaststroke with a with his pointer beside him, and he'd put the lead on the pointer and had the lead in his mouth. Well, the pointer they got about halfway across to this island, and the pointer decided it didn't want to go any further and started going back, so it was dragging him. <laughs> So he had to spit the lead out of his mouth and he kept going and he get he got there and we saw him in 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 Scotland there's heather everywhere but um the deer and things graze any trees that things are growing but because it's an island it had thorns and things growing <laughs> so you saw him get out and sort of with his bare feet trying to get across onto this little <laughs> island found the hawk on the kill took it away from her so she went up again and um, swam back with this great, like a retriever with the, the grouse in his mouth, <laughs> which was one of the, the funniest days I remember with him. But we, we used to have a lot of fun hawking in those days, and they oh, were sure. great days. There was a lot more grouse than there are now, um, which helps make good, good hawks, of course. So most of them, they were all good falconers, and most of them had very good flights. So you, you could actually go out in an afternoon on a day like that when you had my father there as well so four really good falconers and you might see 20 really high classic grouse flights and maybe you know 10 grouse in the bag in those days nice wouldn't be possible now you could go on that same ground now and you got a job to fly two hawks well yeah um which is i think the saddest thing about falconry here is the the lack of quarry whether you're talking about partridge rooks grouse or of rabbits even rabbit numbers have gone there. yeah we, we've got a lot of terrible dangers to the sport here you know you take away being able to tie a hawk to a block or hooding it you're not going to be able to train hawks so falconry's finished so we've got all these dangers and we and, and dangers from conservationists as well who don't understand us though we've done a lot for conservation so we've got those dangers but the real thing that is kidding falconry i think in europe now is and and elsewhere the arabs with hubara and i think I understand sage grouse numbers are going down with you and things. Probably not to such a degree, but it's quarry that is going to end falconry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's another yeah. good reason why we need archives to show people what it was like. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's every passing year, it seems like we lose at least a couple, at least a couple, maybe three, you know, really good hunting spots. And, mm. and you kind of have to start really really branching your network out, you know, <laughs> sending people out yeah. to scout more and more and more and, and just trying to find, you know, just different areas or switching quarry, maybe yeah. even switching the type of bird you're flying to suit the quarry, this, that, and the other. And, and I mean, there's been lots of guys that I know that said if they, you know, lose this or lose that, then they're probably just going to leave the sport. And and that's yeah. going to, that's going to keep I hurting. I think that's one of the big too. dangers mm-hmm. is because obviously the sensible, attitude and i think you're you're forward more forward thinking than we are in this in 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 america but is finding new quarries or different country or whatever but i think one of the dangers is you you get real specialized falconers like me um and i i'm talking to quite a lot of other falconers about this over the last week with different fairs and things going on is suddenly your sport isn't as good as it is and because you've had it good for for a real number of years you then start debating is it worth going to another one because it's not actually going to be at that pinnacle that I've aimed at all my life? Is it, is it actually better to give up and not not? Because the worst thing is to do for, bad bad falconry is the worst sport. My father always had a saying, you know, good falconry is probably the best field what we call field sport, the best field sport in the world. If it's done nicely, you can't you can't beat it. You know, day shooting or or fox hunting doesn't compare to it but he said there's nothing worse than a bad day's hawking or a bad falconer because it it does nothing for anybody 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, yeah, a lot of us are getting that in the back of our minds now. Yeah. Is it worth having really superb hawks and not being able to serve them? Yeah. Because we definitely have very good hawks now. We're, you know, it's one thing that's come out of captive breeding. We've got the certain falconers who have got really, really good lines. And I can think of lines of peregrines now that if you take to Scotland, they're going to wait on. Um, you know, it's, it's isn't that breeding. They, you just let them go and they do it, um, which is obviously a new thing in falconry. But yeah, it, it's depressing. Um, I was talking just before Christmas to a, a lovely falconer who's, who sadly since died. Um, but he was one of the very best, I think. But yeah, you know, he was saying to me, you, know, you can have a hawk nowadays that 20 years ago would have been superb but now you're struggling to make it good because of lack of lack of flushes um and i think that's that's a really sad thing yeah. about modern falconry yeah no i agree it's um like i said it's it's just becoming more and more to where you know it like we're fortunate in some ways in in the u.s because we have things like starlings spare uh, and house sparrows and stuff that are invasive mm. so i mean you're never going to get rid of stuff like that. No. <laughs> you're never going to get no. rid of those birds in our country. They're going to be around forever. Yeah. So, I mean, we're always going to have something. Yeah. If people choose to do that particular type of falconry or whatever, but in different countries, yeah. you know, like here, I can see yeah. it just being an issue. Well, I think the real big difference is you're a big country. So sure. you've still got the space. Mm -hmm. um, that's another thing. Well, one of the reasons why lack of quarry in Europe now, and we're we're probably one of the luckiest in the UK actually compared to to the Netherlands and Belgium and places. But it's the it's the population and yeah, um, keeps in all, all the lovely wild parts of the the country where we used to hawk are actually getting more populated. And um, e even if they're not getting more populated, more of that population want to do, and and you can't blame them that they want to go walking over mountains or, or you know um, hang gliding and things and that all affects us and and sadly affects wild populations birds because because wild populations don't do do well with um with too much influence from mankind yeah yeah, yeah. no i I get it. It's it's going to become more and more challenging every passing year. It's mm. not it's not going to go away. It's only going to potentially get worse. And, and yeah, I mean, it's something that yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see, especially the, the next decade or so. You know what what ends up happening. I think. Yeah, I mean, I hope to God we can keep it going because I've got a ten year old son who's quite interested and had his first tissue last year. And um, yeah, well, I would love to keep it going for him. Well, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's cool that your family has had that generational bug that's been bitten by it. My son, my son, and, and most I think people's kids could care less. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like yeah. your brother, you know. And, and yeah, so I, that's my, what I hear here as well. And yeah. I, I think sadly, there's I'm always uh, in my age group. I'm pretty much unique um, in the being second generation. But there are um, happily a few um, young, yeah. You know, sort of falconers in their 20s i suppose and then even 30s that i can think of now whose fathers have done it before and they've come through so i think i think as falconry got more popular here in the 80s and things it got so much more popular that the, the a certain percentage of sons are going to be interested so sure, sure. So, yeah, yeah no, there I... are more but yeah we yeah. need to keep it going for them yeah, no, I agree. I mean, regardless, yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be somebody's kid who's interested at some point. But that's some, the, yeah. and that's the lovely thing about the archives, I think, because I, I question how much you can learn from falconry centres and things. I mean, I'm not against falconry centres, but I do question whether you... Well, you can't learn falconry from a falconry centre. You can learn how to handle a hawk. Sure. Um, but I, I think probably the one thing that is missing... Or has been missing in the last 20 years with falconers coming on you know back in my the days when my father s started as well as getting help from the odd falcon that was already going they learned an enormous amount from books mm -hmm. and things and you can still learn a lot from books but people don't read books now but at least by getting the archive going we have we do get a few younger falconers coming here and looking at stuff and saying oh yeah perhaps i better get a 
a library together myself um because you you can't learn everything from books but i i think books and, and even looking at faulkner paintings and you know people's letters and things you can learn a lot um to help you 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 still need to learn from another faulkner really but sure you it can add a lot to your education in, within faulkner sure yeah i mean and unfortunately well, I, I should say fortunately and fortunately that, I mean, there's a lot of these books that are now being kind of digitized and made online in, in a lot of different forms. And so uh, the unfortunate thing is guys like me who also love to collect and mm. love to spend a exorbitant amounts of money at times on side hobbies, <laughs> say like falconry book collecting and stuff. Yeah. You know, it's a, unfortunately, a lot of these young people coming up to can't afford to, to buy some of these books, but it's good that they're being no. made available in some form or well, another. We've, funnily enough, we've been discussing that in the archives. We discussed it at our last board meeting because we've produced what, three books now, or four books. Um, I think we're going to digitally copy those as well and get them out there, probably free of charge, um, just so that people, though there are archival books, but you can still learn a bit from them. And I'm hoping that's going to happen more. I think it's something we as an archive can do. We can produce books that aren't um, economically feasible for a publisher mm -hmm. because it's a very limited market. But you know, two of the books, we, all three, three of the books we do, we've done, we um, we actually got funding from other people to help with. So with that funding, we can produce books that normally wouldn't be produced, and we can get by um, by making them digital we can get them out there for everybody and our, our thought on that was we don't think it's actually going to affect the market for proper hardbacks that are nicely produced because there's people like you the, the collectors out there don't mm -hmm. want digital copies mm -hmm. they still will spend the money on on the proper copy yeah. and and i and i don't think it's going to make any difference at all because there's a huge difference between having something on your computer screen or your your ipad and, and a lovely leather bound Falconry manuscripts in your hands. Yeah, I've I've got yeah. friends that refuse to buy digital ebooks mm. and stuff because they want something that they can tangibly hold yeah. in their hand and and read and and smell. In some yeah. cases, you know, people just love the smell of those new books. And well, I'd love to, know, um, yeah. and it's part of the, 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 what we were talking about—the feel of this this archive. I love going to a Faulkner's house who's got a collection, mm -hmm. and if they're kind enough to let you sort of look through their shelves and get the odd copy out to look at. And then when they come back to visit you, that you do the same for them. And I think that's a great part of falconry friendship and sharing sharing the knowledge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, I I think that we need to switch gears back again, though. And you 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 mentioned one funny story about things that you witnessed growing up, but mm -hmm. I want to hear a couple of your personal stories. Some of the more some of the more, I don't know, memorable things that you had happen either with, with bird or a particular hunt or something that, that you've accumulated over, over your years of practice. Well, there's of course hundreds of them. It's trying to think of them You've at the right moment. But, um, <laughs> I do remember the, the, that first Merlin, Jack Merlin that I was given by my father, um, but came from, um, Bill Rutledge. It was actually bred by, um, he owned the parents, but it was bred by Leonard Hurrell, who's a Dr. Leonard Hurrell, who's also another big name in Falconry history over here because he, he was involved with the very early breeding. Um, and his father was one of the most famous naturalists. Um, so I, I got given this and I was training with a lot of help from my father, I have to say, because it was my first bird. And I'm not sure Merlin is your, your best bet for you for a first bird, but... Um, we were doing okay actually, and then you know it was coming well, sort of low on the clearance for a few days. So my father, who was always very keen on getting hawks going loose quick, and I agree with that, but we took it out on the downs near our house, which is only sort of ten miles from here, as the crow flies, in a in a lovely ancient valley on the downs, which is called Valley of the Stones, and it's where a lot of the stones that made Stonehenge came from, mm. and they just lying in the field. There's thousands of these stones and the the Wiltshire name for them is gray gray weathers is what we call sheep here as well and um so anyway we we flushed a lark and i flew this but he went off but he went off and went very high ringing didn't see him again so i was nine or ten as i say um and my 
brother had got his and my father, my brother was younger. So my father said, well, he went that way. Try, try going up to that ridge with a lure. You might get him back. And they carried on flying the other one, which I don't, I don't think would happen in this day and age. I don't think a <laughs> father would let a son go off over a ridge, but I did. And there was no sign of this Merlin, but I, I learned enough to know that it would probably gone downwind. So I followed the wind, which actually took me right over the downs. And my grandfather was a racehorse trainer and he had a yard. So when I got so far from home, I knew it was going to be too far to go back. I thought, well, I'll go on to my grandparents and I can call my my mother to pick me up from there, which is what I did, which was a good seven or eight miles. Yeah. My grandparents were horrified to have this 10-year-old grandson <laughs> turn up with a, looking very bedraggled from a long walk and with a lure. And I can remember it, as a lot of Falcons will know, if you swing a lure for a long time, it wears for your <laughs> skin, the line. And anyway, so I'd lost my first Merlin at my first ever flight, which wasn't a very good beginning. And we, in those days, it was before telemetry mm -hmm. or anything. So we contacted the local police and didn't hear anything for quite a few days. But And obviously it went around the grapevine with Falconers in those days. And um, then I can remember the phone ringing at home and my father talking to somebody quite seriously on the phone. And then he shouted to me, do you have the ring number for the Berlin mark? And I said, yes, I'd written it because he what we've been talking about in these archives, it's very important to keep diaries. Mm -hmm. And so I kept a diary right from the beginning and I had its ring number written down. And he said, it's Jack Mavro on the phone. And this is Jack Mavro Cadate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A Merlin has landed in his next door neighbor's garden and he caught it and he <laughs> wants to know whether it's yours. And that's, well, it's the opposite way to a walk. So I walked north. It obviously gone south. <laughs> the, other the other side of Salisbury Plain. So a good 30 miles from where we lived. And it happened to land in the garden next door to Jack Maverick at Lato, And he caught it. And he said, I'm not letting you have it back to my father unless you can prove it's yours. And we had the ring number, so we got it. Hmm. And I was taken off as a 10-year-old. I already had met Jack, but it was, you know, I was a bit in awe of Jack Maverick at Lato, who was one of the famous falconers. And having to go there and pick up a Merlin that I'd stupidly <laughs> lost was not a good start to my falconry career. But it was, a, I think it was a great great story yeah oh that's that's yeah. that's awesome yeah <laughs> so yeah. yeah but there's i mean there's hundreds of stories but um i i'm my father kept a lot of falconry diaries and i'm slowly, slowly transcribing them and i did read a little bit in one the other day which i'd totally forgotten about but we we'd gone hawking as a family over on sandside more where the fricky potesi and Forco tosti were hawking together from italy and it was always fun going there as kids because you had pasta and pasta was like quite unusual in this country in the late late 60s or well, actually probably early 70s um so my brother and i were looking forward more to the meal than the hawking but anyway um we went out hawking and when we um quite early on during the day again before the days of telemetry um Falco lost a falcon called nebbia who who was quite a nice brookie eye Italian falcon. And she'd gone a long way after Grice, and we had a new rough direction. But in those days, the only thing to do was split up and look for them. So we all found out, and I went off in a certain direction as this young child. And luckily found her and had some a leash in my pocket and got the leash on her and was able to... Um, I couldn't pick her up because I hadn't got a glove, but I was able to wave enough to to get everybody to come my way. And in the diary, it's Mark, at eight years old or something, found his first first falcon. <laughs> so, and she was on the edge of a road, um, which in those days in Scotland wasn't busy, but yeah, she had killed in the ditch on the edge of the road. Yes. Um, but yeah, I was lucky and saw lots and lots of falconry. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Well, going back to the first story, though, I just have to ask this. Which one of your parents was in more hot water with your grandparents about you strolling up after walking? My mother. <laughs> yeah, it was my mother. Um, particularly because I can remember arriving there and saying, could I phone home to get mum to... They were... You know, he was quite an important racehorse trainer, her father. 
he, he was in the top three in the country. And one of the most important things when you're a racehorse trainer is entertaining your owners because that's where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. And they were actually just leaving when I got there to go to dinner <laughs> with a chap called Jim Joel, who was, an art, who was a diamond dealer. And they were supposed to be having dinner with him. And my, my grandmother, because I made them late, was absolutely furious. <laughs> but there we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just, just curious because there's always the, the extra little detail or two that, you know, like yeah. I said, I've been in some hot water before myself, <laughs> so I'm, I'm always curious, but no, that's, that's great though. I mean, I, I'm, I would love to be able to sit down with other guys like yourself and just record hours more of just, just the straight stories mm -hmm. because there's, so many and that's part of you know our mission and why we do this is so that hopefully unless you know somebody decides to set off a huge emp somewhere and wipe out all hard drives and electronic oh, devices or something I mean, our our goal is to get as many of these you know recorded and and passed along yeah well i think that's you know, really so. important part of falconry is yeah. get this all recorded now because yeah. we've we've talked about the dangers yeah. uh, now i hope it doesn't ever end but yeah. there are dangers and that's why archives like this your archive these digital copies of stuff mm -hmm. are, i think the most important thing at the moment yeah 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 no i i agree but uh, well i mean so i guess out of curiosity I mean, we, we can kind of close up a little bit with a, a couple of final thoughts and um, i'll ask you the same question i've asked quite a few others and that what do you think, I mean, in your mind is, is one of the bigger pieces of advice or bits of wisdom or, you know, other little tidbits of knowledge that maybe you can pass on to prospective falconers or other falconers that are just getting into it? I think that the most sensible thing to say would be enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You see so many falconers out there who get, you know, so involved that they're almost not enjoying it because they're, they're so wanting to be the top and and have the highest weighting on Hawk and or at least not have failures in front of other people. We all have failures. So I think forget about that and sure. enjoy it because mm -hmm. it is if it's done well and in the right places, it's such an enjoyable sport. And it isn't just the falconry, it's the company and the country you're in. I mean, some of the wild places I go hawking in Scotland are it's hard to believe there's anywhere in the UK as wild where you can sit. I can remember a day two years ago, I had first kill with a young falcon who I'd gone out a long way on the moor with. And um, it was a, I, like, I like to feed them up on their first kill. Even if you can't fly them the next day, it doesn't matter. Hmm. Give them what they want on their first kill. And she'd killed down in these rushes. I mean, she'd actually done it from a reasonable pitch. Um, but it ended up not a great flight like a lot of first ones because she'd killed in rushes. It was a chase through rushes and she killed, but it was a nice spot and I could sit there in these rushes, let her have her what, what she wanted. I just put a leash on her and tied it to my bag and sat with her. And I couldn't see another house, another human being. I couldn't see anything made by man. And I could see a good 40 miles in one direction to the way to the mountains and I couldn't see. And... Yeah, somewhere like that in Europe is really special. I know you've got lots of places like that at home, but uh, you you'd know. be surprised. I, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they start dwindling more and more each year yeah. too. And but. I was sat there thinking, I'm a real lucky man to be able to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, enjoy it. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a, a great, a great note to end on then. And um, yeah, I can thank you so very much for, for doing this. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. I enjoyed and, it. And uh, no, I mean, it's, um, like I said, it's it's really important I know, to me, especially that I mean, some people write books, some people, you know, whatever. For for whatever reason, I've enjoyed doing this and and enjoying meeting lots of other people like yourself to to get an occasional story here and there, and and hope um, hope we can keep doing it. And um, like I said, I'm 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 really really happy with um, how everybody's you know been in 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 this area so far. I mean, everybody's treated me very well. Everybody's been very cool. Lots, I lots well, I like, of cool stories I like to, think to share. We can so. be a bit hospitable in the UK, of course. <laughs> well, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for for all of my hosts. I mean, there's been a couple. I won't name any names, <laughs> Simon, that that have um, <laughs> you know occasionally made me weed through all kinds of uh, you know thistle thorns, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and 
manual labor, like, you know, pheasant pins and things like that. <laughs> but, but I appreciate, you know, you actually being nice and letting me sit on a nice cushy couch and, and talk to you here for, for about an hour. And, um, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm, like I said, hopefully we get it to do it again sometime soon. Yeah. Well, we'd love to show anybody around at any time. Yeah. Th uh, this is here for Falconers, uh, whether they're English or anywhere else in the world. And they we're not open to the public all the time. We're, we're happy to show public around as well, but mm. yeah, Falconers particularly, it's a real honor to show any Falconer around here. And if, if people want to come and visit, they only have to contact me and we open up. Okay, cool. Well, what's the easiest way just for people real quick, if they want to check it out, what's the easiest way to well, contact Well, we have a, a website okay. and a, a Facebook page, so either of those ways. Okay. What's yeah. the website? It's yeah. um, www.archivesoffalconry. Um, or one. Okay. Oh, no, British Archives of Falconry. Is that right, David? Yeah. <laughs> dot, dot org. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right. Well, like I said, thank you again so much. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's go check some more of this place out. I want to see it before I go. Yeah, I'd love to show you Ramble. All right, beautiful. Thank you. Good. Okay.